So first of all, welcome to London to the first um, workshop of the LEARN project, Leaders Activating Research Networks. Uh, and the purpose of the project is to advocate for proper research data management, best practice in research data management, uh, open data, but not uh, exclusively open data, and then to listen to all the stakeholder groups who are represented here in the room today to hear what their concerns and issues are in taking the research data uh, agenda forward. So we have on the we have 100 people registered to attend uh, uh, today. Um, IT uh, colleagues, library colleagues, uh, researchers, research funders, uh, senior university decision makers, uh, and uh, publishers. So the, the morning sessions are devoted to plenary uh, uh, talks from invited uh, speakers where we're setting the agenda for the uh, um, RDM, uh, the research data management discussions that we want to have this afternoon. So this morning is about setting the scene and, and listening to uh, keynote speakers identify what they think the issues and concerns are. Uh, an equally important uh, uh, set of sessions is this afternoon in the breakout groups. There are four breakout groups, and uh, in the pack you will see that you've been allocated to a breakout group. Uh, so there's a list of names and breakout groups in, in the folder. Uh, and uh, it, we have set a, a set of questions based in part on the plenary sessions this morning, and part on the, uh, on the LERU roadmap, the, the roadmap to research data which the League of European Research Universities produced some uh, two years ago, which is, the, which is the starting point for this discussion about what is required uh, for research, good research data management. And those breakout sessions are really important because we want to capture your, your views. We want to hear what, you know, some case studies that you might have about research data management practice or issues in your institution or in your subject area. Uh, and then these will be worked up into good practice case studies, which will feature in the final report of the project at the end of our two years of uh, uh, fundings. This is the first workshop that we've held for the project. There will be another four workshops, three in uh, Europe and one in uh, South America in the UN, with the UN Library in Santiago in uh, Chile, to try and get the international flavour. Uh, of what is happening in uh, uh, research data management. So your views count, and they will be recorded. Uh, in the afternoon sessions, they'll be recorded by rapporteurs who are taking notes. Uh, discussion and questions in the morning will be captured on film, because we're filming all the plenary sessions here in Chancellor's Hall uh, this morning. And um, they will be mounted on the website uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the workshop. For those of you who are tweeting, we've got a, a, a workshop uh, hashtag for you to, to use. So if, if you are tweeting, it would be useful if you could include the hashtag, because then uh, we can collect all the uh, comments together. So the, the, the hashtag is LearnLondon16. So that's easy to remember, all one phrase, LearnLondon16, as, as the hashtag for the day. So to um, open our proceedings, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor David Price, who is Vice Provost for Research at UCL, who will uh, formally open the workshop. David. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this inaugural LEARN workshop. As Paul said, my name is David Price, and I am Vice Provost for UCL here in Bloomsbury. But I also chair the policy committee of LIRU, the League of European Research Universities, and have been closely um, involved supporting my colleague, uh, Paul Eris, and in addressing the LIRU's thinking on the challenges of Science 2.0, or as I think we now call it, open science. We live in an age of data deluge, but sharing data has the potential to revolutionize the way that research is done. It avoids the costly duplication of collecting multiple sets of the same data, and also it enables researchers from across the world to collaborate more effectively. LEARN is an EU-funded project that aims to take 
the roadmap of research data produced by the League of European Research Universities, as Paul mentioned, to, and to develop this in order to build a coordinated data strategy across Europe and beyond. So, LEARN has many ambitions, but it will certainly deliver a model research data management policy. It aims also to produce a toolkit to support implementation around the world, and also an executive briefing in at least five core languages so as to ensure the wide, uh, widest possible outreach. LEARN will also hold a series of workshops, as Paul has mentioned, within European countries. This first one in the UK, and subsequently meetings will be held in Spain and Switzerland and in Finland, and in one country further afield, which for those who have the pleasure to go there will be very exciting, namely in Chile, in South America. Unfortunately, I don't think I am going to that one, but... Uh, <laughs> the workshop, uh, this workshop and the others, will serve to, as um, an advocate for the recommendations of the LIRU um, RDM, but also they are aimed to gain feedback, as Paul has mentioned, from the workshop attendees, so that best practice and other refinements can be developed. LEARN will address stakeholder initiatives, look at policy coordination, the take-up of digital infrastructure, and LEARN will support cooperation with developing countries and nations. LEARN will therefore deliver support actions to quicken the uptake of research data management and the move to open data in emerging world research defined by the open science agenda. So the open science agenda is being supported by the European Commission and its constituent themes and actions will actually be announced at a big European open science conference this April. The Open Science Agenda has a number of top-level ambitions with regard to the use of and management of research results and data. And they include several things, which I'll just highlight three. First, that data should be FAIR, F-A-I-R, that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Secondly, all EU researchers should be able to deposit, access, and analyze European scientific data sets through an open science cloud. And thirdly, all young scientists in Europe should have the necessary skills and support to apply open science research routines and practices to their own endeavors. So universities are used to talking about open access to publications. Open access to research data is a much more recent concept and is not without its challenges. And this is why LEARN is so important. Its outputs will act as an advocacy tool for research institutions across the globe and set the pace for discussions on research data management in the open science environment. I'm sure that your workshop today will be an exciting one and marks the first step along this new and challenging path of 21st century science in Europe and beyond. So I wish you luck and thank you. So we, we uh, start the formal sessions with our first uh, uh, plenary speaker, and it is my great pleasure to welcome to the platform here uh, Professor Geoffrey Bolton from uh, the University of Edinburgh, who is well known as the uh, coordinating editor of the Royal Society report, Science uh, as an Open Enterprise. And Geoffrey is going to speak to us this morning on open science and open data. So Geoffrey, the floor is yours. I'd love to say that I'm limping because of a skiing accident, but uh, 
I merely fell on the parquet floor. Shocking, really. Good. So this meeting is then ostensibly about uh, research data management, particularly in universities. And what I want to do is to set a broader context for it. And I think that broader context is the one that David Price has already mentioned. It's about open science and, and open data. And I want to try to address uh, three rather fundamental questions. And that is, what is all this for? Why are we doing it? Why does it matter? And why does research data management therefore matter? Uh, what are the major challenges we have to confront? And how do we organize ourselves as a scientific community, not only nationally, but internationally, in order to make something that's of value realizable? Uh, one important thing we have to recognize, I think, is that we are on the cusp, or have been on the cusp, of a fundamental change in technology. Uh, a, a change in the technology by which knowledge is stored, uh, is accessed, and is communicated. And an important and interesting question is which of the habits which we, that we have developed over the years are specific to that technology, but are not in reality fundamental, and which, if we retain them, will inhibit our capacity to exploit a new technology. So what's fundamental and what's merely a temporary adaptation to a particular technology? Uh, I would argue that the most fundamental uh, principle that is common to both is that of openness. And my argument starts with this man, Henry Oldenburg. Henry was the first secretary of the newly created Royal Society in London in the early 1660s. Uh, he was a German theologian who was an inveterate correspondent, corresponding with people that we now call scientists the world over. Uh, Henry had a bright idea, and that is, why should I keep my correspondence private? Why don't we publish it? And he persuaded the new society to do exactly that. And this is the title page of the first volume of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, published in 1666. But Henry had two requirements of his correspondence. The first was that they should write in the vernacular, and not in Latin, which doesn't seem to be a big thing now, but it certainly was then. And the second, much more fundamental, that he required his correspondence not only to present a concept, an idea, an opinion, but also the evidence on which that was based, the data, in other words. In other words, the modern era of science began with openness, open publication and open exhibition of the data, the evidence which underlay, un underlay your concept. And the reason for its power, and many historians of science have argued that, that the power of this association the, uh, of data with the argument uh, has been that it permitted others to scrutinize the logic of the relationship between evidence and, uh, 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 and concept. It permitted them to replicate observations or experiments and therefore to, to demonstrate error if there was error. And it led to the idea that science in some way is self-correcting. And also, of course, what it underlines is the important part of peer review is post-publication peer review. Pre-publication peer review is interesting and useful, but nowhere near as fundamental as post-publication peer review. This is a lovely quote from Arthur Kustler. Uh, the progress of science is strewn like an ancient desert trail with the bleached skeletons of discarded theories which once seemed to have eternal life. It's that principle which is one of the two key issues that we have to confront if we're going to cope with the, the data deluge. Uh, to exemplify the problem, uh, this is me about four years ago in Antarctica. Some 30 years before, a colleague and I had done an experiment in Antarctica uh, in which we had collected seven, seven hard-won data points on which we based a rather simple theory, uh, which was then taken up by others. They were able to see the, uh, the, 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 the method we'd used, the uncertainties that, uh, uh, and the errors that we had estimated, uh, replicate our data, add to it, improve the theory, and so on. But four years ago, we collected using modern digital acquisition techniques, uh, maybe, I don't know, seven petabytes of data, a lot. And the challenge for us now 
is to make that data available, which we're currently doing, in a way that others can scrutinize in the way they scrutinized our, mi our, our miserable seven data points 30, 30 years ago. It's a big challenge, and one to which we have to rise. And there are severe problems. Uh, um, this is a, an abstract from a paper, in, paper published in Nature about four years ago, where a group of American scientists had taken the top uh, 50 benchmark papers in preclinical oncology from the preceding decade and attempted to replicate the results. They were unable to do so. They failed to do so in 89% of cases. Uh, that failure has been mirrored in other attempts in other parts of the biomedical sciences, in, uh, most recently in economics, uh, in social psychology, where the majority of the papers in each one of those cases has proven not to be replicable. You could, in fact, draw the conclusion that most of our published science is just wrong, utilizing good old Henry Oldenburg's view. Now, why were there such low levels of replicability? What is quite clear in some cases, it's misconduct and fraud. People have literally invented data or selected data. Uh, invalid reasoning is not uncommon, particularly where there are very large amounts of data, where the statist statistical techniques you use have to be, have to be well um, ad adapted to the, the data you're using. Uh, the third one, and probably the most important one, is absent or inadequate data or metadata. In other words, you may be right, your work may be correct, but actually no one is able to demonstrate that it is not correct, but at least doesn't have apparent errors. In other words, it's as good as myth. It just ain't science. And our strong conclusion in the Royal Society report some four years ago was that the data that underpins a scientific argument must be made concurrently available at the time of publication, and to do otherwise should come to be regarded as scientific malpractice. Now, there has been a major revolution in the last two, three decades. This uh, diagram shows the, the location, the global location of data storage. Uh, the years immediately after two, the year 2000, the beginning of the millennium, were important years. It was in those years that the total amount of data stored digitally exceeded that which was stored in an analog fashion in floppy disk, on tape, uh, 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 and, uh, and on CD. The important thing about that is that digital storage is far, far cheaper than analog storage, and it, in part it's responsible for this enormous growth you see, which only goes up to 2007, and uh, eight years later now, we're a, a long way further uh, on, on that line. A consequence of that seen here, in 2003, you might recall, it was announced that the human genome had been sequenced for the first time. It's taken 10 years and cost over $3 billion. Nowadays, we can do it in three days, and it costs about 1000 bucks. And as a consequence of the decreasing cost and increasing capability of, of, of digital storage. Uh, we see that in the broader world, where all, now almost any device that has a power source has the potential and the capacity, and increasingly it's being exploited, to, to acquire non-digital, non-trivial uh, non information from its immediate environment, the so-called Internet of Things. Uh, if you look at all these objects and devices which have power sources and are capable of acquiring information, um, a major business is now developing worldwide, or businesses are developing worldwide, which is based, are, are based on harvesting that information, selling it on to other consumers. When, every time you go shopping, your, what you've shopped is you, you put in your uh, loyalty card, um, it recognizes you, they know what you've shopped, people have information, data about, about you, uh, and socially created data becomes privatized effectively. And one of the large questions is, Who's going to control all this? If, for example, our social scientists were able to have access to this extraordinary and growing data resource, then our capacity to be able to understand the way in which the human species and its society operates on a daily basis would be very much enhanced. At the moment, much of it is contained within the private domain. Some concerns have been made about, for example, the database state, the idea that somehow the state can have this information and is able to, is able to control our lives which, which in ways that hitherto have not been easy. 
Um, but which would you prefer? A democratically elected government to control your data or an un undemocratically unelected major international company to control it? In other words, the privatization of knowledge is a real concern. And those of us who are concerned deeply about new knowledge ought to be concerned to, to fight the battle to maintain openness and accessibility so that knowledge remains a public rather than a private enterprise. One of the interesting things here, of course, is uh, how much of that information is crystallized into knowledge? That's an almost impossible question to answer, but one or two uh, people have attempted to do so, and their conclusion is it's less than 1%. Uh, so there's a big challenge there, and a, an enormous opportunity, and somewhat of a fear. Effectively, somehow, in the sentence that you see beginning just above the top of the screen, the, the large question we have is how do we reinvent uh, effective means of reproducing data for the digital age? How do we retain the essential principle that was initially formulated by, by Henry Oldenburg? It's a large question. The other question, of course, is do we really have confidence that the efforts that are represented by the LEARN project are worthwhile? My answer would be yes, we do. And the most obvious place for it is the commercial world, where uh, this diagram shows in blue the uh, job availability of statisticians in commercial companies uh, in the USA as represented by advertisements for jobs. In red, you see uh, the uh, trend amongst, uh, of employment amongst data scientists, dramatically increasing over the last four to five years. Now, companies that care most about the bottom line are not going to uh, employ people just for the sake of novelty. They do it because they see real value in that, and I think this diagram illustrates very well the challenge in a sense we have to uh, duplicate in the universities. If, the, if companies find that conventional statistics can now be replaced by much more efficient ways of utilizing data in a highly efficient way, then I see no reason why the same shouldn't be true of us. So what what is what potential value does there lie uh, for the priorities of universities in all this data? Now, um, <clears throat> I've called the call this slide "Drivers of of Change for Science," but I use science in the sense of the European sense of scienza, which, in, if you like, I, I define as uh, a, as a formal uh, approach to knowledge, which is rationally explicable and, and, and reliably applicable. Now, that phrase ought to apply to all the things that are done within universities, whether they're natural sciences, lingu linguistics, uh, humanities, whatever. I mean, that ought to be true of all of us. And having spoken at great, at great length with people from a, the wide range of university disciplines, my view is that it, at heart and in essence, we're all basically do, try, trying to do the same things. This just happens to be one example from a series of um, satellite devices uh, which are concerned to understand what happens on the tops of clouds, fundamental for the Earth's climate. Uh, they're, they're measuring different things, but different parts of the same phenomenon. Uh, the amount of data which they send to Earth is enormous. It's a large volume, and the rate at which data comes in is very, is very great. It's big data, high velocity, la large volume. But also, of course, the data that each one of those satellites is collecting relates to the same phenomenon. And if we can find theoretical semantic links between the data collected by satellite A and satellite B, and we can integrate that data, then what's happening is we're, we're getting a much deeper understanding of the phenomenon which they're trying individually to, to monitor. And semantically linked data, in my view at least, is actually the golden prize that we should be looking for. It permits us to address issues which we, traditionally we have found extremely difficult to address. And of course, if we're going to have uh, linked data of that sort, then that data's got to be accessible. In other words, it's got to be open and comprehensible. And of course, the fourth uh, element, which I've already referred to as cost reduction, the fellow at the top right here is holding a microsatellite. Now, 30 years ago, a satellite was about half, half the size of a garage. Now you can hold it in your hand. The cost of putting satellites into space is primarily the cost of the launch. Now we can put sat 50 satellites in, into space at the same time rather than just one. 
uh, and you on your research grant can probably afford your, to have your own satellite launch for about a quarter of a million pounds. So it's part of the whole process of, of, of cost reduction. Now this is my fancy slide showing, if you like, the pillars of the data revolution. And for me, it's big data, volume, velocity, and variety. It's linked open data, semantically linked data, with many, many databases, semantic relations between them, and the potential to derive a deeper meaning. But down below, I've got machine analysis and learning, which is an important issue I'll come on to later, text and data mining, about which we'll hear something later, and at the base of that, the foundation of it all, it, it, I think, is, is openness. And just to give an indication of the, the areas of understanding that have been very difficult to tackle in the past, but now become an opportunity. In my view, complexity is the key issue. It, complexity is something which, uh, with which the natural sciences and the, the social sciences and humanities grapple with almost daily. As a natural scientist in the past, I would say that we have been pretty good at analyzing uncoupled systems, where there's a relatively simple or just a straightforward relationship between cause and effect. But coupled systems where they, the elements interact with each, other's, once, with each other, once you have more than three or four components, become extremely, can become extremely complex. What's happened in the last 30 years is we've been able to utilize the modern computer to understand how a uh, couple, highly coupled systems should, in principle, behave. Uh, on the left-hand side here is, is a, a simulation of a couple system with six individual component parts, um, which produce extremely complex patterns of behavior. Over the last few years, because of the digital revolution, we've now, we're now able to characterize complexity and not just simulate it. And that's enormously, enormously important. So the opportunities that we see in front of us are that we are able to identify patterns that hitherto we've been unable to resolve. We can uh, deduce the existence of relationships that otherwise have been beyond our capacity. And we can probably for the first time in a rather fundamental way tackle complexity. One of the best examples of the use of, uh, of com complex simulation and complex characterization in my view is modern weather forecasting. At the top of this, you have uh, 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 data, satellite data, and earth-bound uh, earth data, which attempts to characterize the state of the atmosphere at any one moment in time. We can then put that into uh, a, a computer simulation uh, in which we predict or forecast the evolution of the atmosphere by utilizing the equations of motion. After one day, after two days, after a week, after a month, we can characterize the, that forecast with another snatch at reality. We can iterate with another attempt to characterize the state of the atmosphere. What inevitably happens is that the simulation has drifted away from the real evolved state of the atmosphere. But the computer can pull the simulation back to reality. And indeed, it learns that for different states of the atmosphere, you have to pull it back by different amounts. And what it's meant is the iteration between model and data has given us forecasts, which I can tell you, compared with 10 years ago, are extraordinarily good, astonishingly good. So that, those, those are some of, the, some of the potentials. There are some really severe problems, there, however. It's not good enough just to have data to collect the data. The question is, do we use it properly and do we use it well? On the left-hand side, the top left, you see a simple uh, regression line. Uh, plotting two variables, A, A, A and B, one, one against the other. Uh, we have much more complicated regression-based statistics. We're able to identify and characterize the locations of and the density of, of clusters. But once we have distributions similar to the ones at the top right, the one that looks like an, like a, like an ostrich in the circle, then the question is, how do you characterize them? Uh, you can put a regression line through them if you like. It'll be completely meaningless. But actually, we do that a lot. We, do, we apply a lot of inappropriate statistics to these large data, large data volumes. Of course, one of the things we now need to do to utilize topological approaches, whereby, whereby we map the variability and we attempt to capture that variability mathematically, uh, which has, has problems of its own. So one of the challenges to us in the universities is, to, first of all, to do the research that will 
create for us the means whereby we can visualize complexity. And secondly, of course, we need to think deeply and seriously about the edu about statistical education, not only of our students, but also of ourselves. One of the problems of complexity, however, and it's on the left-hand side, you can see uh, um, some data sources from um, satellites, from aeroplanes and the like, and below some of the key issues that they attempt to address of agriculture, of ecology, of energy, and so on, uh, which is the interface between social and uh, uh, natural phenomena. Uh, data from those various sources can be pulled into a machine, into a computer. It can be integrated and linked. Uh, and what is the output? The output can be a series of terms, say 40 expressions, which describe a topological distribution. Well, classically, of course, the way in which we understand things is we visualize them. You know, if I plot a graph for you, then we can see the relationship and that's a nice visualization. How do you visualize uh, a phenomenon which in which a machine has created, say, 40, 50 terms to describe a distribution? There's a really profound uh, potential problem that's looming now, and that is the disconnect between machine analysis, machine learning, and human co cognition. What's the human role in all this? Can we scrutinize what's inside the machine, the black box? Can we follow the process through? And in any case, who owns the box? And what does it mean to be a researcher in a data-intensive age? These are crucial issues that surround the issue of you know, how we manage our data. And of course, there are new ways of doing things, which, we, which the technologies which, which acquire, store, manipulate, and instantaneously transmit uh, data put into our hands. This is Tim Gowers, a mathematician, a, a Fields Medalist mathematician from Cambridge. About seven years ago, Tim put on his blog um, a problem, which a long-standing mathematical problem, and suggested some possible ways of addressing it. And he invited others to contribute. He had about 30, 30 principal contributors, and over a month, um, by iteration, they claimed that not only had they solved the original problem, but a harder generalization of the problem. Tim's comment was, it's like driving a car, whilst normal researchers like pushing it. So why did we do more of this? And the answer is very simple. It's uh, the criteria for credit and promotion. The we individually are not incentivized to do this, and what is more, our institutions aren't incentivized to do it either. In other words, we are feeding the ref, and we're feeding our own careers, but actually, are we feeding the process of enhancing human understanding? And, and when I spoke earlier about understanding whether habits which are related to an unmoded technology are inhibiting our capacity to exploit for the public good a new technology, that's a very good example and something we really have to address with great, great seriousness. <clears throat> now, I've talked about the, the challenge, the opportunities, which are considerable, I think. The question is, how do we respond to them? And uh, this is, my, uh, uh, this is my, uh, my, my slide of what infrastructure looks like or should look like. Um, Science is an international enterprise, but actually it's done by scientists who are contained within national systems, which have their own priorities, their own habits, their own sets of relationships. And we have to address that, and they will look different. I don't think you can define a generic system which will be universally applicable, simply because the, the national settings will condition the way in which you apply it. I, I would argue that the nas a national infrastructure, part of it's above the above the waterline, the tip of the iceberg, but actually the big bits underneath. Um, we have the obvious parts of technology, are the wires in place on machines on your, on your desk? Is the European, does the European cloud exist? We have a consent challenge, which particularly applies in areas of social research, biomedical research, when the key question is, uh, are we invading the privacy of individual subjects? But then beneath the waterline, we have some really very difficult challenges indeed, which I've separated into those which are challenges of processes and organizations and challenges for people. In relation to processes and organizations, the ecosystem challenge, I think the ecosystem is the research councils, government, government priorities, the universities, uh, research li libraries, bodies like JISC in the, U in the UK case. What are their relationships? 
Can they march in step, or are they all moving in different directions? Can there be a coherent set of relationships which will define the way in which the ecology works? It's a very considerable challenge. How do you get your national house in order? And of course, what it implies is that if we're going to move to a situation where we can exploit the potential benefits of open data and open science, it's not good enough just to have the university do it unless the funders, governments that set priorities, and individual scientists are all signed up in a broad sense, then actually it will be much more difficult than you suppose. In other words, there's a systemic issue that has to be addressed. It's not merely a question of getting the data management right. There's a funding challenge, of course. All this costs money. Is it worth it? In my, sense, my, my view, there's now a bit of a sea change taking place. A few years ago, we went to a university, mine included, and said, uh, uh, are you doing this? And we'd say, of course we are. You know, we, we are responding to an imperative from the funding, from the, from the research councils, and, but it's a culture of, of acquiescence. It's not a, it hasn't been a culture in which we've been heavily in, involved. Now what's beginning to happen, I think, is that some universities are deciding this is the future. And irrespective of any barriers or, 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 or persuasion from above, this is something they must do. And of course, part of the, the a key part of that challenge is the support that universities give to their researchers. Uh, if you're a linguist or a, or a biologist, do we also expect you to become a data science and an informatics person? And my view is, no, I don't really. I want you to be a good biologist. I want you to be able to tell a lion from a tiger rather than just look at a, 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 a large data set. Uh, and my view, what is required is that, is that the fundamental library function as providing access to knowledge and information remains, but its actual expression is different. 30 years ago, we started consolidating our deep mental library into large university libraries. It was more efficient and more effective. Now, in my view, we have to disperse the library again, and the people who will be amongst the dispersants actually will have different sets of skills as data scientists and engineers. As far as the people are concerned, they're the skills challenges. You know, do they have the, do they have the, the, the statistical uh, knowledge that's required? Um, are the incentives in place that will persuade someone that it's worthwhile making their data open rather than trying to hug it to your chest? And finally, the mindset challenge. I mean, I go to cold and miserable places to get my data. Why should I share it with you? It's mine. Well, actually, I've got to get used to the idea, and we all have, that we are temporary custodians of the data which our fellow citizens through their taxes have ultimately paid for. Uh, and I think that's a fundamental issue. So I would say that the national infrastructure is both hard infrastructure, the wires and the boxes, but actually the really important bit is the soft infrastructure of, pro of processes, organization, and people. Now, over the last few years, quite a number of international bodies have spoken urgently uh, uh, and with great force about uh, open data, open science. Um, uh, UNESCO, um, the OECD, the G7, all of them have, uh, have made the case. But actually, for the first time recently, we've had what arguably the international scientific community speaking to. Um, four major bodies which represent, first of all, the International Council for Science ICSU, the, in the Inter-Academy Partnership, which is all the world's national academies, the International Social Science Council, and the World Academy of Sciences, which is the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, got together under the auspices of something called Science International in South Africa in, in, in December and created uh, an accord on, open, on the principles of open data. What the accord does, it sets out a series of responsibilities for scientists, for institutions, for publishers, funders, for learned societies, and for libraries. It defines what it believes to be the boundaries, appropriate boundaries for openness, and then set out some principles which ought to underline some of the crucial enabling <laughs> practices. And what it will try to do over this coming year is to um, have um, some governments, uh, most scientific and learned unions internationally, which represent the international component of, of, of research disciplines, um, national funding bodies, um, bodies like UNESCO have already signed up to this, I think, uh, and bodies like LIRU, Universities UK, and the representative bodies of universities worldwide. And the purpose, in a sense, is to ensure that we're all aware of a set of fundamental principles that really ought to underline the way we do things, and then, in a sense, it's up to us in our national contexts 
to make sure that nationally we can adhere to those principles and do things in ways that are both sympathetic to the international frame but also are, 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 are useful uh, uh, within the national frame. Just as an example, the, there, there's one rather fundamental normative uh, principle and that's the one which I put up here, uh, which I'll read Publicly funded scientists have a responsibility to contribute to the public good through the creation and communication of new knowledge of which associated data are intrinsic parts. They should make such data openly available to others as soon as possible after their production in ways that permit them to be reused and repurposed. That's a statement of should. It's David Hume 200 years ago said that uh, um, you cannot deduce should from is. In other words, principles like freedom, uh, um, justice, are not deducible by observing the natural world around you. They're somehow in here, and that in a sense is the same sort of thing. The rest of them are much more, much more pragmatic in, in some ways. One of the other things that Science International decided to promote and to undertake was an open uh, data, an open science platform in Africa. And the argument is this, that um, we, this world cannot afford yet another looming knowledge divide between the haves and the have-nots. If we're going to address global problems, we need global participation. What's more, uh, middle and low-income countries probably have more to gain from an open data, big data environment in areas that really concern them, agricultural productivity, the operation of their financial systems and so on, uh, than, than uh, Government countries which have very highly funded uh, science systems. And uh, what, what is, all, is beginning to be funded at the moment is a platform which would incorporate uh, a growing number of African countries in a network. And the purpose of the platform is to share infrastructural investment whilst being sympathetic or acknowledging the fact that different countries have different capacities to pay. It's shared good practice, it's shared capacity building, and it's system development, this idea that you really need to look at the whole system from the level of government down to that of individual scientists. So there will be a plat or a coordination forum is being created at the moment, which will also link to international standards and programs, and will be a means of coordinating government priority setting, of funding and incentives in the system, capacity building, training and skills, roadmaps such as the LIRA roadmap, which will look different from place to place, and essentially flagship projects which are designed to apply to key African problems and issues. Um, and the reason for doing it on an African basis is simply because, of course, African countries, through the African Union and other bodies, have learned to work together on a number of domains, and so an African platform is a sensible way of configuring those efforts. It's crucial, of course, to remember that Individual disciplines now have organized themselves in ways that are highly creative and are exploiting the digital uh, revolution very effectively. This is an example of the Elixir program in the life sciences, uh, which is an extraordinary re re resource. I, I was at uh, one of their meetings in the summer and spoke to a couple of young researchers, PhD students, saying, but uh, surely the, the Elixir rule is that as soon as you've sequenced your data, you send it to Elixir to be shared through the system. Surely you're giving away your gold dust. Oh no, they said, you don't understand. Uh, our data is a rather puny amount. Here we have access to an enormous data resource, and all we have to be is cleverer than all the others, which I thought was just the right answer. And of course what's happened now in linguistics, uh, it's the data sharing of this sort is going on at quite a pace. The chemical crystallographers are crystallographers have been doing, doing this for years and wonder why the rest of us have been slow in catching up. So actually, the institutional focus, let's say, of LEARN has also got to think about the, the science community focus of bodies like this and how the two can, can interact because we want them to interact in a creative and a positive way. This platform idea is interesting. It's been developing really quite rapidly. We had a meeting in Brussels last week in which the Commission or the the uh, uh, the director of uh, of DG12, uh, Robert Jan Smit, uh, said, "Well, uh, we're going to announce a European platform on the 4th of April in the meeting that's already been alluded to." 
um, a South American group from Conocit, which is a major South American funder, approached uh, Science International uh, shortly before Christmas and said, we'd like to think about the development of, of a South American platform because they have existing modes of collaboration on, on which one could build that. The Australians have been doing it for years. I mean, eight, ten years ago, the, Australians decide, the Australian government decided to put real money into this. And I was in Australia in the summer, and actually you can really begin now to see the impact of that and its, and its utility. So something is happening internationally. And I think what's crucial is that given that there are so many, uh, so many initiatives taking place, that we should be aware of them and ensure that we exploit them to maximum benefit rather than having them set up in competition with each other. So that's all about open data. What about open science? Now, I, I think the European Commission is being a little rather conservative in the way in which it addresses this issue of open science. What does it mean by it? Well, to a large degree, open science in the Commission's terms means open data, that's the, the three, three uh, uh, squares in the middle, and open access publishing. Uh, there's also uh, a, a drive to do what, what's called, what I call here doing science openly. Um, but the question is, open to whom? And in the Commission's, if you read the Commission's documents, that's open to other scientists. Is that enough? No, it's not. Science has, is, and will continue to change the world we live in. In democratic societies, if involvement in this process that so fundamentally influences us is contained within a small sort of priestly caste called researchers, then democracy suffers. And in my view is it's an issue of primary of democracy. Somehow, we have to kick open those closed laboratory doors and make science a public rather than a private enterprise. In other words, we need to address the stakeholders and recognize that communication and dialogue must be audience sensitive. If I talk to my, my peer in my field of glaciology and geology, uh, then I talk in one way. If I talk to my neighbor next door who's a dentist, I have to talk quite differently. Uh, and the key thing, of course, is one thing we have learned in applying scientific knowledge is that actually it's not us telling them what to do. They've got to be involved. There are so many instances of this whereby the crucial thing is we want to have to move towards a situation where we are jointly creating knowledge and understanding, and it's not just a question of we researchers telling others how, how they should behave. It's the joint, the, the creation of knowledge that is, that is key here, and the stakeholders have to be involved. I mean, in the UK and elsewhere, UK primarily probably as a consequence of the development of things like research assessment exercises in the early 80s, we now create an enormous mountain of science. What do we do with it? Not very much, really. You know, we take a bit here and a bit there. We don't even mine it properly. Um, shouldn't we be addressing the broader use to which that science might be put in a much more effective way? Uh, universities have changed fundamentally in, in their self-image in the last 30, 40 years. Universities now regard themselves as if they're primarily research institutes. Uh, in the 1960s and early 70s, university academics called themselves university teachers. Show me any academic these days who would dream of referring to themselves as a university teacher. Somehow we've got to I'm going to change the way we do things. Now, there's a bigger and a broader enterprise, really. I mean, uh, and this is something that's been developed uh, by social scientists, largely initially in response to the total lack of activity in response to the scientific work on climate change. We've been putting together and stimulating work on climate change now for 30 years in a way that's designed to influence governments nationally and internationally, and have signally failed to have any effect. Um, our social science colleagues tell us that's because you've completely ignored the fact that there's something out there called society. And they advocate this, an idea which they call open knowledge. So if you thought of those three vectors that are shown there, what's, what, 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 have, what, have we, what have we been doing traditionally? We apply standards of rigor, which good old Henry I, in my world at least, uh, promoted, of innovation, do, finding new things, and I mean innovation here in the use of the English word rather than the jargon, uh, and solutions for policy and, and, and things that can be carried on by, by industry. One of the things that we haven't been so good at is engaging with other stakeholders. We've engaged with ourselves. We need to engage with more stakeholders. 
And also, of course, if we're going to tackle some of the major problems of the human species, then we, we have to ensure that we can move on much more effectively from the monodisciplinary, siloed uh, perspectives that we currently have, where, for example, getting natural scientists and social scientists to work together is, is a dreadfully difficult business, to one what our social science colleagues call transdisciplinarity, where the borders of the multidisciplinary enterprise are permeable and information can come in uh, as well as out. So there is a very large challenge there, and I think what is important is to recognize that uh, we'll never get there. We will never have our knowledge creation and use as efficient and effective as it, as it could be. Why? Because technology will be changing, society will be changing. And the crucial thing is that we start to walk, move in the, in, in the right direction. I think we've got a game of catch up because we haven't really realized what's been happening in the last 20 years. But if we catch up, we, won't get to the, we certainly won't get to the leading edge the crucial thing is that we've really got to change. There's a, there's a direction of travel, and what I s hope is that, is that LEARN will contribute to that. What I would say, I was really pleased to see that uh, there's a meeting in Sa Santiago de Chile. Um, I mean, it would be good, actually, if this emerging South American platform could be involved with that as well. And that's, a, that's one of the areas where I think you're going to have to look out and see who's doing what, and somehow trying to ensure that uh, you, know, you synergize in the most, most effective way. So uh, all I can say is good luck. Thank you. Jeffrey has very kindly agreed to take questions. So if there are questions, could you raise your hands and we'll get a microphone to you so you can ask your question. Who, who would like to start? Thank you very much. My, my name's Danny. I'm from um, University of Cambridge. Uh, I'm interested in your comment about, particularly the last one, about interdisciplinary communication and, and the idea of communicating with our public um, and not preaching at them. Um, this just uh, reaches to my science communication, which is my previous life. Um, because I think that really making work open and putting an open version of an unintelligible paper into the public domain doesn't really help and the language that is used in any particular discipline is completely impenetrable to not just the public, but any other discipline. And so I think it's quite important that we start pushing that researchers aren't some great god up there, that they actually need to start talking in language that's understandable to everybody. Oh, I, I couldn't have said it anywhere near as well as, as you have. No, I, I, I agree entirely. It's, it's, it's really quite, quite, fun, quite fundamental. Um, and I think, in a sense, it's, it's some sort of sense of what do we think we're doing? What is our role in society? And my view is that uh, most, most academics of my acquaintance, they would like to be able to feel that they are doing something of, soci of, of societal value. They're not just a sort of small scale of the bankers, if you like. Um, I mean, we're absolutely delighted when someone actually reads what we write. It's just ama amazing. Um, I think, however, there are some... Uh, uh, crucial problems that we have. One of them arises from this, the non-reproducibility phenomenon. Uh, now that might be a temporary phenomenon. I suspect actually it's a generic phenomenon about doing research. Research is difficult to do. To draw robust conclusions is not easy. Uh, and I think one of the problems that we have is the way that science is taught is it's understandable but unfortunate. Um, s scientific has come to mean precise, accurate, true. Those of us that are scientists don't think of it like that. We think of it as about uncertainty and somehow controlling wherever we can uncertainty, which is difficult to do. Why is it understandable that our education doesn't really capture this at all? It's because, of course, the things that we teach our students at school, at least, and hopefully not at university, but sometimes I fear that we do, are things that are really very well known. You know, we understand gravity and Newton's laws extremely well. And the presumption when those who don't become scientists have to confront some of the 
conclusions that arise from science in policy terms, they think, well, this isn't science. It's just full of uncertainty. I mean, how can we cope with it? And I, you know, I, I do think we've, we've, we've made science into a bit of an icon which is somehow separate from the normality of human reasoning. It isn't. Uh, and I think, so I think it goes pretty deep. And what really worries me is, I, mean, I hate to use a phrase like when the machines take over, because in a sense, I mean, sense that, you know, our capacity to comprehend what's actually happening in the machine. We've somehow got desperate to, hold, to, to, to find a way of continuing to understand what manipulative and analytical tools are being used, what are they saying? Because if we lose that connection, and with the, the sort of, I think, the weaknesses of our science education, I, I really do fear for us. Um, Han de Lore from the University of Leuven in Belgium. I want to pick up on what Danny said. Um, you say that you, your colleagues are really wanting to contribute to society. I must say from a very practical point of view, that's not my experience. Um, I'd wish it, it would be different, but <laughs> to give a very practical example, we have installed a request button, a uh, request copy button. You know, whatever you have in the report, whether it's data or whatever, use it. People don't react, and if you ask them why, so they, what the hell is this guy from this country and this business going to do with it? So there's a problem of, I won't say older <laughs> professors, let's say senior professors, who <laughs> sometimes, sometimes that, I mean, there's a proverbial ivory tower, but it's turning into a platinum tower, and it's getting more and more difficult to have these people change their minds, say, yes, anyone who has a question on your research is entitled to have a decent answer. And to us, it's increasingly frustrating to try to convince these people. And I find it like treating a three-year-old child like, if you do that, you get a prize, you get a promotion. I think, I fear it's the only thing that will work, but it does question my belief in scientists. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, I mean, I, I hesitate to say this, because I've said it once before, I agree with you entirely. The, the distance between what my colleagues would wish to believe about their role and what they actually do is large. If, for example, I mean, I would suspect that were I sitting in a bar with most of my colleagues, young and old, they would say, well, actually, my fundamental role is contributing knowledge to, so that it can better be used for the, good, for, for the public good, good. But then if you say what that would mean, then when they face the grim reality of the time they're going to have to spend out of the lab, and the probability that in the present system that won't be recognized because the criteria for promotion and advancement are inappropriate. So I think there's a gap between the rhetoric on the one hand and the reality on the other. And one of the crucial things that senior people in universities and beyond have to think about is how do we close the gap between the rhetoric and the reality? And I'm sure you're right, you know, that it's got to be a question of, you, you people intuitively measure the importance of something by the reward or the financial benefit that is associated with it. Uh, if we simply uh, exhort them to do this, but show where our priorities really lie by how we allocate our resources, then it's not going to work. And I mean, I, I think we ha in this country we have a really severe problem. We have a research assessment exercise, a rare for research excellent framework. There's a very powerful driver of academic behavior. It has changed universities in Britain out of all proportion over the last 30 years. And it, it does so to the exclusion of most other things, largely because the other things are not rewarded in anything like the way that yet another wretched paper in a high-profile journal, as we say, actually just having produced one in a high-profile But <laughs> anyway, um, I mean, there's a, it's a really serious problem, which has to be taken up at the highest level. Um, hello, Helen McAvoy from the University of Salford. Um, I was very interested in what you said about uh, dispersed library services. Um, I presume you're not talking about physical presences, you're talking about um, disp dispersed ser services and support actually um, going to where it's needed. Could you say a little bit more about that, please? Uh, y yes, I mean, I, I think that uh, 
if, if I talk to my students about uh, the library, I say, how often do you go to the library? And they say, we don't go to the library. So what's the library for? The library is to pay the subscription to electronic journals. Um, and I mean, if that were the case, then the case for the library would be zero. Yeah. But actually, um, I mean, some people have said, well, what we now need is to get our computer scientists to occupy this domain, this territory. And I, I would say, no, I don't think that's right. I think what's really important is librarians have an ethos which it has deep historical roots, and I would trust that ethos to move, to, to have them move into a different set of skill, skill, skill terrains than I would trust the computer scientists merely to service the rest of us. And I think that, I mean, li libraries and library groups, Lieber, of which Paul was president, uh, have been very creative in thinking deeply about what this new technology means for the li library. And, uh, you, you're right, I, I mean, it's not a question of sending individual librarians back to departments, but actually having a, a different set of skills, which is the modern way of serving the, the traditional role of the library, and actually having individuals work with people in departments and help to develop, develop you know, if you like, a set of good practice rules in the departments. And of course, there's an educational role to be played. I mean, some very interesting work being done mm -hmm. by a guy called Tony Hay, who's tried to define what this blanket term of computer si uh, of, of data scientists might mean. You know, he subdivides them into data engineers, data scientists, and so on. And uh, it's, there's a lot of, lot of very creative thinking going on. And I, and I do think our libraries actually are coming to grips with it, which is a good thing.